welcome to Church Online this weekend. Uh, I hope you had a great week and uh, welcome Anita, my little partner in crime. Yep. So good to have you here this weekend. Yeah. And uh, we're kind of missing a few people this weekend, Anita. We are. I think there's something in the air. Yeah, I think there <laughs> is. So if you're not sure what we're talking about, men's retreat is happening this weekend. And I know that all the men who are out there are having amazing time, wonderful food. They may be a little bit chilly, but I know they've got a fire as well, <laughs> yes, Anita. That's right. So I'm sure they're keeping warm and yep. not getting up to too much mischief. We'll yep. never know. I'm sure there's a lot of connection happening. I'm sure there and is. And speaking about connection, if you are new to Bayside Church this weekend and you'd like to fill in a connection card, there's a link in the chat right now. We'd love for to hear from you and connect you to a connect group and other people as well in the church. We also have communion this weekend. So if you haven't got your emblems ready, now's the time to go and get them. And we're going to head into a time of worship. Beautiful. Yeah. Lord, we just really thank you as we come into a time of worship that you just settle our hearts, Father, and that we can just really sing uh, with our mouths, but not just words, Lord, but just with our hearts as well. And we praise you and we just thank you in your name. Amen. Freedom. 
make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give peace.
be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and your children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 Communion, as Jesus instructs us, is something that we should do in remembrance of him and remembrance of what he accomplished for us on the cross. So what does this act that Jesus went through for you, what does that mean? I want you to consider that for a moment. Does it mean salvation to you? Perhaps it means freedom. Perhaps it's a fulfilment of a promise. For me, it's about redemption. You know, we are born into this world and we come as we are. We don't ask to be brought into this world, but we're here. And it might not feel like we need redemption sometimes, but that act of redemption has spanned eternity to reach us. We see redemption like a thread and it started as we read in the Bible. Um, it probably started well before that because God is all knowing. He sees the beginning from the end. And so from eternity, it has spanned through time to us and from us, it will go further than us into eternity. What an incredible concept that this plan that God had for redemption for us is as huge and as vast and as inconceivable as eternity. Yet, that perfect sacrifice that Jesus made is as detailed as a thread. The thread of redemption. From the formation of life, all the way through eternity to us and then continuing on for eternity. That redemption is available. That redemption is for us and with us. How amazing. Let's just consider that for a moment. I'm going to read a scripture to you from Colossians 1 and verses 13. And it said, He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son whom he loves. In him we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. I don't know whether you're at the lowest of the pits right now or if you're on the highest mountain or if, like one of my friends says, she's just doing the plod to get through life day to day. I want to encourage you and I want to tell you today that, friend, that redemption that Jesus provided for us is so available. It's as personal as reaching out your hand and grasping that thread. So as we take 
the bread today or the wafer or whatever you have in your hand for communion, I want us to consider Jesus' body, what it meant for him to go to the cross for you and for me. That redemption that you are receiving through the blood and the body of Jesus. And I want us to consider today as we take the bread and as we eat it in remembrance of him. Let's eat today. And as we take the cup that signifies the blood of Jesus, that blood that was poured out for you, for your redemption, for my redemption, for the redemption and the salvation of eternity. Let's consider today, as we drink this cup, what that means to us, his children. Let's drink together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you had a plan even from the beginning of eternity that you saw us in this moment and that intimate knowledge that we needed redemption. Jesus, we thank you for going to the cross for us. And Holy Spirit, thank you that today you give us fresh revelation of what that means. And as we continue to worship through this next song, I pray that you would help us to see in all your glory the goodness of God and the perfect Prince of Peace that Jesus is. Amen. Thanks, worship team.
the name of the Lord our God. Thank you, Lord, that we get to praise you openly and that we can come to your throne room with open arms, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Carlos, that was beautiful, it was, wasn't it? Thank you so much for a wonderful worship set. And now we're going to um, have a look what is happening in and around our church life. Hey church, it's great to be with you this weekend. Let's see what's happening. Have you ever wondered how church works? Maybe you're new to Bayside and want to know what we believe and how we express that. Our discipleship pathway answers those questions and many more. Sign up today for step one, which is step to God, or step two, step to church, on Saturday the 18th of June on Zoom. One of our key initiatives for 2022 is to strengthen our prayer lives as a church community and individually. An opportunity for this to happen is our monthly Immerse Night. This is a space in which we can worship and pray and soak in the presence of God. Join us on Thursday the 16th of June at 7.30pm in the Church Auditorium. As we enter into winter, many in our community are doing it tough. Bayside Community Care have the privilege to serve many wonderful people and we have the opportunity to partner with them. At the moment, the need is highest for cans of soup, UHT milk, tea and coffee. Please consider purchasing some extras of these and replacing them in the yellow bin at reception. Young adults, it's been a minute since we were together to worship and be prayed for. On Friday the 24th of June, that all changes. So come along from 7.30pm as we spend time in worship, praying for one another and hearing from some of our YA team. Have you ever considered joining our sound and lighting team? We have opportunities for new members on our team with full training provided. So if you're interested, contact the church office. June is First Fruits Month. This is when we as a church community partner with God for all He has for our church. This is a free will offering separate to our regular tithes and offerings. If you'd like to give tax deductibly, please give to the Bayside Foundation. Otherwise, you can select Bayside Church. If you'd like more information or to register for anything you've seen here, head to the Bayside Church website or follow us on Instagram or Facebook. There is so much happening in the life of our church community, my goodness. Uh, we're also going to come around a time of offering right now. And if you'd like to give today in uh, your normal offering and tithes, there's lots of ways that you can participate in today's offering. Right, Kay? There certainly is. Yeah. I'm going to share a short message today. And it's based around 2 Corinthians 9, 6-7. And it says, Each man should give as he has decided in his heart. Mm. He should not give wishing he could keep it. Or he should not give if he feels that he should not give. God loves a man who gives 
because he wants to give. That's beautiful. And you know, for me, Anita, it's the last line that really speaks, where it says, God loves a man who gives because he wants to give. And God sees where each one of us is at. Yep. He knows how we're feeling. He knows if we're good or if we're not so good. And he sees our heart and why we do what we do. So let's be encouraged today yep. that your Heavenly Father loves you. And as he gives us so much, yeah. let's give back to him with a grateful heart. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that passage, right? Yeah. And another way that we can give in the month of June is through our first fruits. Mm. And do you want to explain just a little bit what our first fruits offering is about? I mean, yeah, sure. So for the month of June, over and above our normal tithes and offerings, we have a wonderful opportunity to sow into our church community. And these funds actually really go into beautiful programs to serve the people of our community and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we've heard so many testimonies of how in the giving, people have received so much and been blessed so much by God. And so if you wanna give by First Fruits, there's a beautiful video coming up now. Thank you so much for your willingness to contribute to Bayside Church's annual First Fruits offering. There are a few ways you can give, so here are some tips to help make giving as simple as possible. If you don't need a tax deductible receipt and are giving through the church website or the Tytherly app, simply search for Bayside Church Melbourne, then type in the amount you want to give and select First Fruits from the drop down menu. If you do require a tax deductible receipt, you will need to search for Bayside Foundation and then follow the same process. If you wish to give your First Fruits donation over a period of instalments, you will need to fill out a First Fruits giving card and provide all the required information which you can see here. Thank you so much again for your continued generosity in supporting the work that God is doing through Bayside Church. So great to be with you, Bayside Church, and I hope you are keeping warm. My goodness, it is cold. Winter has definitely descended upon Melbourne, but hopefully you've been fortunate enough to maybe even escape winter. Can you believe it? it we're halfway through the year. I was clearing out some of my things and um, came across uh, my actual strengthen bookmark that we handed out at the beginning of the year, and I went, oh, we're in June, so that means we're only six months away from Christmas. Not that we're counting, but um, great to be with you. And um, I really look forward to sharing this word with you today, particularly. Uh, I want to focus on prayer as prayer is one of our goals. As I uh, picked out that bookmark, um, it listed that prayer, we want to strengthen prayer, particularly this year in all areas of our life. And you may have chosen the spiritual discipline of prayer in the new year restart at the beginning of the year. And I saw a lot of people choose prayer, which is just wonderful. And I hope that went really well for you and that you've been able to continue the good habits that you established in that time. Um, keeping in mind, just really simply, that, that prayer is all about relationship. It's all about communication. If you're in a relationship with someone, you want to be able to communicate and we're invited to be in relationship with God. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, part of that relationship is that we communicate. We listen, we speak, we listen again, we speak. It's this continual uh, communion that we have uh, and that we're invited to with God. And I think that just is outstanding, that the, the God of the universe desires relationship with us. And so today um, I particularly want to focus on prayer from the book of Exodus. Now the book of Exodus is not something that you would naturally think, oh yep, that's a book about prayer. Uh, it's a familiar story. Many of us know it well, but for those who don't, I'm just going to recap a little bit for you. Um, we, ha we have the children of Israel. They're in Egypt and they've been in slavery for more than 500 years. I mean, that is like such an extensive period of time. Uh, they're in bondage, they're in slavery, they're an oppressed people, and they're at their wit's end and they cry out to God uh, for deliverance. And God hears that cry. They, he hears their call for deliverance and he 
taps someone on the shoulder by the name of Moses and says, Moses, you're the man. You're the man to go in and deliver my people from slavery. Now, Moses was a bit of a reluctant, um, we can call him prophet. Uh, He was reluctant to go ahead, but he finally stepped up to the plate and he confronted Pharaoh, who was the ruler at the time, uh, and asked him to let the people go. Now, you can imagine Pharaoh thought that was pretty much a joke. He was relying on three million uh, Israelites. Uh, He was relying on their labour. So you can imagine the effect of just letting them go on the economy. And so, of course, he wasn't going to just let them go. But through a series of miracles, well, really a series of let my, you know, Enough's enough, Pharaoh. Let these people go. God brings plagues on the nation of of Egypt. And uh, finally, Pharaoh agrees to letting them go. And Moses leads out these three million people uh, out of Egypt. And we have this most spectacular scene. If you've seen any of the movies with Charlton Heston, this spectacular scene of the Red Sea splitting open and like a wall of sea and the children of Israel Israel are led out. Um, But of course, you know, Pharaoh had, uh, you know, doubted the fact that he had let them go and the army was in sue to chase after them. Unfortunately, they didn't share the same good fortune of crossing the Red Sea. They were actually swallowed up. And so this is spectacular, miraculous story of God delivering uh, the children of Israel out of bondage, out of slavery, and he brings them through. But once he brought them through, it became a bit of a what now moment. It actually reminds me of, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Madagascar, Uh, The penguins in the zoo break out of the zoo amongst other animals and they're just craving to be back in the Arctic, I think it is, uh, craving to be back where they're they're naturally been, where they come from. That's their heritage. However, they've never actually lived there before. And they get to the Arctic and as they come out, they look around, it's blowing a gale, it's a blizzard, and they look around and they go, well, this sucks. (laughs) You know, what they thought would be good all of a sudden wasn't. And so very much, it was only day two, um, you know, the children of Israel had experienced this miraculous uh, deliverance and they're in the wilderness and day two, they had a this sucks kind of moment. They start grumbling and complaining to Aaron and Moses about the fact that there's no water. And so, you know, they grumble and say, come on. And Moses goes to God and God provides them with water. It's a legitimate need. But as he provides the water, he says something very interesting. And in Exodus 15, 26, he says, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. God is reminding them in this moment as he's providing this water that the most essential thing for them to do is to listen to him. And if they listen well and act accordingly, they will be blessed. But two months go by and the food that the, that the Israelites had brought with them as they left Egypt runs out. And so now they're without food. And so did they listen well to what God was saying in that moment? It seems not. I'm going to pick it up now from the book of, uh, of Exodus chapter 16. And we're going to read a good chunk of this story, which I'm then going to draw from some truths about prayer. So in verse 2, it says, In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. 
So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he's heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he's heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. I'm now going to jump to verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you'll be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. And that evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they needed. They need a taken omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gave, gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much they needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. And then in verse 35, the Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. There is quite a lot in this passage of scripture that I want to draw from today, but I particularly just want to highlight three things about prayer that I want to encourage you in your own prayer life and particularly with the title of Seeking Grace. The first point is God dislikes grumbling. And the Bible is pretty clear about that. In Philippians 2.14, it says, do everything without grumbling and complaining. You know, the children of Israel were pretty good grumble bums, but sympathetically, I kind of think they're justified. They were in slavery for 500 years. They're let out and they're let out to a desert. First, they have no, food, have no water and then they have no food. You know, some people in life just have their fair share of stuff to deal with. So grumbling every now and then really doesn't seem that bad. It seems almost justifiable that there are some situations which allows for it and calls for it. I mean, there are those days where we just feel like the world is against us. Nothing seems to be going our way. Everything that we plan go, is, becomes unplanned, unplanned. We have, uh, you know, unplanned diagnoses come across our, our path. We have unplanned events. Uh, there are th people across our path who are just painful, like terrible drivers on the road. Uh, you know, you plan to do a good day's work and the internet goes down. You know, there are just days that you just feel like screaming, but you don't. You hold that in. You just grumble a little. And it feels kind of like a dignified outlet, right? Well, sadly, no. I did a search on the word grumbling all the way through the Bible. I was, I was adamant, surely there is a place for grumbling. And what I found was every context of the word grumbling was negative. There wasn't one positive uh, light on the action of grumbling. So why? Why is this such an issue? We're all called into relationship with Jesus and we're called in that relationship to be his witness to the world. And somehow being that witness does not involve grumbling. We are to reflect God's love, joy, peace. God doesn't want us to reflect grumbling. Grumbling essentially is discontentment of some unmet desire. And often that unmet desire is, is not met in our own timing. But the, but the discontentment becomes more than that. It becomes unbelief. We don't believe God can actually meet what we need, not just what we want, but actually what we need. And if we sit with that, if we sit with, with what we truly need, we find that there is a myriad of ways that God can provide for that need. But when we grumble, 
We also tend to blame others, the children of Israel blaming God. We tend to place ourselves in a higher, superior position like we know better. And we don't take personal responsibility. It doesn't make us feel good. We might think it does, but it actually doesn't because we ruminate on those negative thoughts and feelings. Discontentment and unbelief creeps in because we actually listen to a myriad of different voices. You know, we have the voice of the world and what the world is saying. We have the voice of perhaps people in our world and we have our own internal voice. And then there's the voice of the enemy. And amongst all those voices, how easy is it to listen to the voice of God of what he's saying about about the situation? When we choose not to listen to the voice of God, then we're choosing not to flow where there is peace, where there is joy, where there is, yes, patience, all those things that he is in, he's inviting us and calling us to. And when we choose not to follow his voice, we can't expect that peace to follow. When we listen to anything else, other things creep in. Grumbling, if left unchecked, becomes a habit. And the problem with habits is that it doesn't just affect you, it affects also the people around you. It's like yeast, it expands. Now, I had a a personal sort of testimony on this. In the first year of lockdown of COVID, uh, my gym, like most gyms, closed down. And my sister actually belonged to an outdoor gym group and they were doing um, routines out on the beach but you had to partner up with someone and you obviously could only do it in your own time because the restrictions wouldn't allow you to do it more than with one other person. And so my sister asked me if I could, if I'd like to join her in these uh, routines. Now I thought I was a fairly fit person. I did pump, I did Zumba, uh, but this was on a whole nother level. Uh, There was running involved. I hadn't run in ages and there was all these really intense exercises like burpees and and I'm not just talking about five burpees. I mean like 20, 30, 40 burpees and all sorts of different things. So you can say that I grumbled a bit. In actual fact, I probably grumbled a lot. Um, I remember, you know, running up the street and I could barely breathe as I was doing that. Uh, I hadn't realised how unfit I was. And I was really just, yeah, annoyed. I was annoyed that I couldn't keep up. I was annoyed at the exercises and I grumbled the whole time to the point where my sister just said, hey, enough. You're just always whinging and and grumbling and complaining. And it was a bit of a wake up call because I hadn't actually realised I was doing it. And I went away thinking, oh gosh, I I don't want to be that kind of person. I don't want to be that, you know, whinging, grumbling person. Um, you know, I, want, I wondered what this was about. And as I sat with it, I realised obviously my, my strength and ability was being tested. But rather than asking God God's help in that moment, I was just turning to my own strength. And, uh, and, and the other part was maybe I needed to recognise that I could only do so much and that, you know, bit by bit I needed to grow. And so, you know, it's, there are those moments where we do need to self-reflect. We do need to look at ourselves do you find you're, you're grumbling? Do you find that you're in that place a lot uh, where you're grumbling about what's going on around you? Do, you? do you wake up feeling you're ready to grumble at the world? Well, we may couch it as venting or letting off steam and, and getting things off our chest, but if it becomes systemic, then that's a problem. You know, God doesn't mind us coming to him and expressing very freely how we're feeling. You know, we are called to have an authentic relationship. This is not about saying, I can't go to God and express how I'm truly feeling. And and being genuine in that, if we're having a bad day, he wants us to go to him and telling him about that. But if our prayer life just becomes a grumble session where we don't actually stop and listen to what God's saying to us, about that situation, because that's what prayer is, it's two-way communication, then all we're doing is getting stuck in grumbling and complaining and nothing is going to shift. God wants to be found in the midst of our frustrations, our anxieties, our concerns. In fact, he wants us to find peace in those places when we invite him in. And that's all we really need to do. Rather than choosing to grumble, 
we, ch- we, we can choose to invite him into that place, speak to him about it, and then listen to what he's asking us to do. We need to express our desire and trust in him that he can change and provide for the situation. And that brings me to my second point. God provides daily. You know, the children of Israel had experienced God as a, as a deliverer. They saw this miraculous um, turn of events as, they, as he brought them out, out of Egypt. But now they were needing to experience God as their provider. And not just on this one-off event, but on a daily basis. You know, when we come to Jesus, maybe for you, it was a momentous moment when you invited Jesus into your life and you remember it really well. The thing is that God doesn't just want to be in those big moments. He wants to be even in the boring routine moments of our day. He wants to be there all the time and provide for us. And so for the Israelites, God provided manna, Uh, in the morning and quails in the evening. And they had to go out each day to collect this manna and these quails. Now, the the manna tasted like honey cakes, yum. And the quails, oh my gosh, double yum. Now, I grew up uh, going to my auntie and uncle's house uh, often uh, and we would have this amazing feast because my uncle would hunt quails and the whole family would come together and my auntie would, would cook them with these amazing um, herbs and then she'd cook up polenta. And I have really fond memories of as you know extended family gathering around the table uh, and eating this yummy dish of quails. But you know what? As much as I love quails, I don't know how much I'd fancy eating them <laughs> every day for 40 years. Uh, If you were someone who came out of Egypt and actually made it to the land of Canaan, I worked out, and that's basically only two people, that's Joshua and and Caleb, I worked out they had eaten manna and quails for 14,600 days. Whoa. Uh, I, I I couldn't do that, I don't think, but I guess if you have no option, that's what you do. I mean, it wouldn't even be that much of a mystery if you had a MasterChef mystery box, would it? But I'm sure there's different ways you could cook it up. But I digress. The the Israelites had become so totally dependent on this daily provision of food and it became a habit. Every day they would go out and they would gather it. Why couldn't they just store it up? I mean, the organiser in me, the efficient me says, store up, I only have to do it once uh, and then I've got enough for the whole week and then I'll go back out again. I mean, that's how I shop. I go once a week and, you know, why did they have to do it daily? I really think this speaks to how involved God wants to be in our life. God needed to change the worldview of the Israelites, a worldview that says being self-sufficient and depending on no one is the way to go. Now, does that worldview sound quite familiar to you? It should because it's very much in line with our worldview. Our culture celebrates independency and self-sufficiency. God's view flips this on its head. He says, I want you to depend on me for what you need. I want to be the one who nourishes you. I want to be your provider, not just once a week, but on a daily basis. You know, when I became a Christian and I shared with family and friends, um, you know, of my new faith, A number of my friends actually struggled with that, and that might be a familiar experience of yours. And one friend in particular said to me, you know, I just can't get over it. God's a crutch for you, isn't he? And the way she said it sounded really quite insulting and a bit of a, you know, in the moment I was a bit offended. Um, But then as I thought about it, and I thought about the picture of a crutch, you know, if you have an injury, you need a crutch to lean upon. And I thought, well, that's actually a good thing to lean upon something when you, when, you know, to lean upon something that can hold you up. And I said to her, look, yeah, if, if I I do, I need God in my life. I rely on God. I can't see my life going forward without God. So if you see the term as crutch, then yeah, I'm all for it. I'm all for, for God being my crutch. And I don't actually think that's a bad thing. Relying on God is something we actually learn. And God invites us to approach him each day. Now, have you noticed that all we have is today? Often we want today's 
provision for tomorrow. We worry not only about today, but tomorrow and, and about the next week too. Jesus reiterates daily dependency and not worrying about tomorrow. And he sa- tells us that in Matthew 6:34. It says, not, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Our worry only drives us to control situations rather than rely and trust God. And the Israelites chose to disobey God and gathered more manna, more quails. Some of them did anyway. And they chose to store it up rather than going out each day and relying on God's provision. And that food turned to maggots. I mean, gross. Um, you know, I'm, Itali- I'm of Italian heritage and in, in, there's an island off Italy called Sardinia and they have this cheese delicacy, which probably will make you feel ill, but you cut into it and it's crawling with maggots. And, a, and apparently people eat this. I don't think I'll ever choose to eat that. I mean, I will just like my calcium, not that much protein with my calcium. Thank you. But anyway, we can't wriggle out of, do you like that? We can't wriggle out of this daily reliance on God. This is how God desires to work in our lives. Because if we're just depending on ourselves, then why do we need God? Why do we need God in our lives if we're just going to rely on our own sufficiencies? And our sufficiencies are so limited anyway. He wants to be involved in our lives. He wants to provide for what we need. And he wants to be glorified in the midst, in the midst of the situation, knowing that he is working through us and that the people around us can see oh my gosh, this is not just you, this is God at work. You know, God wants us to be relying on him for daily provision. And that should sound familiar to us because it's part of the Lord's prayer. In verse 11, it says, give us today our daily bread. You know, giving us our daily bread is about God wanting to provide for us nourishment, spiritually, mentally, physically, everything that we need to be whole. He wants to provide for us. And all we need to do is to come to him on a regular basis each day, many times in the day, and commune and rely upon him and not just rely on our own sufficiencies. This provision from God is a gift. And, you know, another word for this gift is grace. It's supernatural. It's beyond our own ability. And God desires to grace us for what we need for the day ahead. He wants us to ask for what we need and to boldly come before him asking that. Which comes to my final point. God provides, we gather. You know, this manna didn't just land on the Israelites' doorstep. They didn't wake up one morning, open the door and there it was, not having to do anything. No, 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 they actually had to go out. They had to go out and gather the manna, gather the quails and then bring it in. It required effort. And we cannot assume that God just reads our minds and does everything that goes through our minds. I mean, that would be scary. Um, If God responded to everything that was going through my mind, I would hate to know where I am at. Uh, No, he desires that we come into communion, that we come into conversation, that we spend time listening, that we get in tune with what it is we truly need and that we talk and we ask and we seek. That's what he desires for us to do. I find it quite remarkable that Jesus, as he was ministering, blind Bartimaeus, who was on the side of the road, was yelling out, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops. And he goes up to blind Bartimaeus. And, you know, it's fairly uh, evident what this guy wants. But Jesus doesn't assume and he actually asks uh, Bartimaeus, what is it you want? I mean, come on, Jesus. He wants his sight restored, doesn't he? No, no, Jesus doesn't assume because he doesn't know if that's what Bartimaeus wants. He He gives Bartimaeus the freedom to choose and to ask. And I believe it's the same with us. You know, Matthew 7, verse 7 to 8 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. 
You know, our part is to go out and seek. Sometimes as we sit with what it is we need, we seek to understand what is it that I really desire? What is it that I truly want? And I knock on that door, God opens the door because he's always ready to have that conversation. And I ask, I ask for what it is I truly desire. You know, sometimes those desires are more than the things we want. Sometimes what we need is to be assured. Sometimes we need peace. Sometimes we need strength. Sometimes we need patience and resolve to know the Lord's presence, to be confirmed. There are many things uh, that we need to tap into and really just sit with the thing that we think we want. Underneath it, what is it that's a true desire and asking God for that. Now, as part of the restart journey this year, I chose prayer as well as one of my disciplines to strengthen. And I chose to do a prayer of examine, which is a prayer that you do once or twice a day. I chose to do it twice a day. And you begin the morning and you end on the evening. And it's a simple coming before God, getting in touch with what you desire, asking God for the grace of it. And at the end of the day, you review your day and you see how God has answered that prayer. And I have to say, I was completely wowed as I really spent time at the end of the day to see where God's touch and hand was and where I felt that thing that I desired uh, and how he provided it for me. I, I was truly blown away by how God is so intimately involved in my day. And so right now, I would love to invite you to a moment of contemplative prayer where I will lead you through a, an examine. And so if you'd like to just settle in your seat and maybe close your eyes and really let your whole body relax. You may want to feel how the chair is holding you and supporting you. You may want to feel the firmness of the ground. And then if you want to just listen to your breathing, the inhale and the exhale. And I begin by thanking God for what I'm thankful for this day. And just spend a couple of minutes in that place. I now speak to God about the challenges I may face today. I share with God about what's lacking in my heart right now.
I now ask God for the grace I seek for the day ahead. And I share any last thoughts in this moment of prayer with the Lord. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. That prayer, uh, prayer of examine, is very simple and it can be something that you can introduce in your daily um, practice as you come before God. And, and if you do, I really encourage you at the end of the day to just reflect back on how God has met that need, that desire uh, to to see where his hand may be on it. Keeping in mind that always that, you know, as we ask God, sometimes he answers straight away and sometimes we need to wait. Sometimes just as the Israelites were, were really much tested in, we sometimes we need to wait for God's goodness to come and to rely on, on his timing, not our own timing. So I hope you've been encouraged by this word today and as you, you know, in your own prayer life, remembering that it's so important that we can be free to express our feelings with God, but let's not be grumble bums along the way. Let's take those frustrations, concerns to God in prayer and then let's listen to what He says to us. Let's make effort. Um, let's meet with Him daily to, to receive from Him and to listen from Him because He so much desires to be involved in our daily life. Thank you, Bayside. God bless. Have an amazing week. And here's Kay and Anita. Thank you, Sandra. What a wonderful, Sorry. wonderful message on prayer. Um, I'm part of Pastor Christie's Contemplative Prayer Group. And it has been such a wonderful opportunity to just sit in God's presence and really hear His heart for your life and, you know, your future and your family. A uh, beautiful, beautiful prayer group. It's amazing, isn't it? I love connect groups and there's so many different connect groups yeah. that you can actually belong to. So if you would like to be in a connect group, please get in contact with us during the week. Otherwise, if you have any questions about the Christian faith or about the Bible, Pastor Rob yep. runs Tuesday Night Live <laughs> every does. week and uh, send through those curly questions. He would love to uh, <laughs> go and study and actually he loves work those. them out. <laughs> and uh, otherwise, have an amazing week and yep. we will see you next weekend. See ya. Bye.